or sorry, five, finally, how does this information from the DEIS shape the city position on alternatives? Um, oops, there we go. All right, so going through those questions, um, I'm just going to kind of go through each question and answer in re in relation to the Chinatown International District, what the current city findings are. These are the, our draft findings. So number one, does the DEIS demonstrate compliance with city codes and director's rules? And our summary finding for the Chinatown International District is that more analysis is needed, in particular relating to cultural and historical resources. While the DEIS does provide a whole lot of narrative and information about some of those resources, it's lacking in visual representation that would really help uh, the city and community understand um, what those impacts are going to be. Um, in addition, uh, we found incomplete disclosure of some of the impacts to specific landmarked facilities or community facilities. So, um, and just here lists just a, a handful of them. Um, and so we would like to see in the final EIS a more full and robust uh, acknowledgement of some of the impacts on those community facilities. Uh, the second question, does the DEIS provide uh, or identify and evaluate project impacts? Does it include appropriate mitigation? And this is really the heart of what a DEIS is supposed to do. It's supposed to reveal what the impacts are going to be and, appro and appropriately um, provide measures to mitigate those impacts. And we knew going into the DEIS that the mitigation plan would not be fully fleshed out yet. And unsurprisingly, when we read the document, it wasn't. And so here are some of our findings in regards to um, this question of, of impacts and mitigation. Uh, the summary, more analysis is needed to more fully assess impacts and propose mitigation. Specifically, we would like to see mitigation identified for the construction impacts to traffic and transit, access to businesses during construction and emergency access, particularly for elderly residents. Um, and this is most closely related to uh, road closures that could prevent emergency access into into parts of the community. Uh, we'd like to see mitigation plan for the business and residential displacement, particularly temporary and permanent impacts to Chinatown International District businesses. Uh, we'd like to see the mitigation plan for uh, the permanent parking removal. And then impacts to city structures, including the 4th Avenue South Bridge and adjacency impacts to the Hing Hang Park area. Um, the third question, does the DEIS provide information to meaningfully compare the alternatives? Does it give us what we need to know in order to make a decision on which alternative is the best for the, the system or the project? Uh, and the summary that that we find um, that the Chinatown International District is one of two areas in the system that we don't believe enough information has been provided to inform a decision. Uh, we we believe that without the understanding of how the impacts would be mitigated, we can't understand the full breadth of what the, those alternatives would mean for community and for the city. And so we would like to see a construction management plan that demonstrates the traffic and transit reroutes and detours during the years of construction and those road closures. We'd like to see a mitigation plan for the community impacts, including business and residential displacement and relocations. And then we'd like to see a broader conversation about community benefits to address cumulative impacts and historic harm. And we believe without all of that additional information, it's hard to make a decision about what the right alternative is moving forward. So now putting those kind of legal questions aside and going into these more strategic questions that the city is asking, does the DEIS adequately analyze impacts to BIPOC communities further the RET outcomes? Um, we do think that this that Sound Transit did a lot of work in the DEIS, but we would like to see some additional analysis. Um, there are some specific examples um, for Chinatown International District and Delridge, which are our two rep priority communities, where we'd like to see an expansion of the methodology to look at uh, displacements and affordable housing. Um, we'd like to see additional analysis of small business displacements, particularly recognizing that the uh, business displacements in Chinatown International District don't just impact the local community, but it is a regional hub. And so we want to recognize that those impacts have a regional uh, scale, uh, potential regional scale. And then, of course, the mitigation um, that should be proposed in there. We'd like to see an update to the RET report um, and then coordinating on identifying the tools. This would be part of that mitigation plan to reduce residential and economic displacement and providing support to small businesses during construction. 
So before we go to the, the final question, which is, um, you know, what, what does this mean for a position? Um, first, looking just at the comments on the DEIS, what do those comments mean? Um, the comments are critical of the DEIS, of the analysis, and again, that is appropriate for the point in the process that we're at right now. Um, it is our job to be critical of this document. It's our obligation. Um, but we remain a strong supporter of the project. We want to see the project move forward. We intend to support eventual permitting and construction, but we really want to work with Sound Transit between the DEIS and the FEIS to ensure that the project is going to comply with city codes and um, uh, regulations, either through additional analysis or through modifications to the project. And then again, really, really coming back to this mitigation um, uh, plan, uh, finding ways to avoid, minimize, mitigate the impacts either through project modifications or through a mitigation plan. And we look forward to working with Sound Transit uh, during that time and intend to continue working with community throughout that time. Um, we're aiming to ensure that our city decisions, particularly a decision on a position on a preferred alternative, um, is centering racial equity, co-created and truth checked with community. And we listen through a variety of, of venues, including the CAGs, including these workshops and one on one engagement, the letters that uh, community based organizations and community members are sending us um, and and briefings. But the final question is, what does all of this mean for a position on a preferred alternative? The city is has two board members that will take part in the Sound Transit Board action, um, uh, Mayor uh, Harrell and Council President Juarez. Um, and we will also uh, likely have a city council resolution that will take a position on what that uh, Sound Transit Board action should be. So what does all of this DEIS information mean? Um, in short, we have heard at the CAG meetings, we've heard at workshops, we've heard a lot of the community concern, very real community concerns about the impacts associated with the Fifth Avenue South options, um, particularly the business displacements in the heart of the CID community, and the city shares those concerns. Uh, we also see that there are unresolved issues related to Fourth Avenue South impacts and costs, um, particularly the traffic and transit diversions through that multi-year road closure, and what those diversions would mean in terms of impacts to the local community and residents, to regional mobility and to the roadway structures that those um, those vehicles would be diverted to. Uh, the city feels right now based on the DEIS information and what we've heard from community that we cannot endorse any CID station option as a preferred alternative without understanding how these impacts would be mitigated. And so we would like to see a joint process with community and Sound Transit and the city and other partners to work out the details of those mitigation uh, measures, that mitigation plan for the alternatives later this year before an action on a preferred alternative. And so diving down a little bit more in what that process could look like, this is uh, this slide, these three steps were shared yesterday at council as a as an idea to put out there and we're interested in hearing feedback today on what this could look like. Um, but for Chinatown International District, we seek an additional analysis on impacts and mitigation and additional process to address community benefits, RET outcomes and historic harm. And so the, the three pieces of that, that that we see right now, one, kind of pressing pause on the board action that um, providing time for community uh, by removing the pressure to identify a preferred alternative right now. Um, two, pressing for stronger refinements to avoid minimize impacts uh, to community and three, developing a partnership with community, with philanthropy, with King County Metro, with Sound Transit, with other entities to address the longer term impacts and historic harm. And so drilling down a little bit more on what those three steps could look like, what this could include. The first one, um, do not choose a preferred alternative until more analysis is available, um, but possibly reduce the range of options. Um, in particular, from what we've heard at the CAG meetings, what we've heard from community members, there doesn't seem to be a constituency for those deep options. And so maybe this is an opportunity to, to put the deep options to the side and really focus on what would be the mitigation for the shallow options, 4th Avenue shallow and 4th Avenue shallow diagonal. Um, and then develop those mitigation plans for those alternatives to help inform their comparison. Uh, but of course, what else should this, you know, leaving each of these open to uh, additional uh, fleshing out to understand what each of these steps could look like. Um, the second, pressing for stronger refinements to avoid or minimize impacts. What this could include would be um, a focused process, maybe six months, 
um, to develop refinements that would avoid or minimize impacts and costs. And I know a number of refinements have come up in the CAG meetings and in other venues about, you know, whether the stations could move slightly further north of Jackson, whether there's other ways we could change the entrances or change the configurations, the, the platform configuration, the station location entrances to allow for a smaller footprint or allow a, a less uh, impactful uh, station construction. Um, and then also the second bullet, really have an opportunity to coordinate construction timing with other projects to minimize the impacts to businesses and historic structures. And that's something that we've heard cons consistently throughout our engagement on this project is the need to better coordinate all of those infrastructure investments. And then three, um, develop the partnership. And this is that longer term, longer term commitment um, to acknowledge broader cumulative impact, past harm and develop strategies to repair that. Securing resources for acquisition and displacement above and beyond what just mitigation would be um, by the project. Develop a long term community development strategy and explore funding options for it and then partnering across public sector and philanthropy to implement solutions. And this is something that regardless of the preferred alternative, this is something that we would want to see moving forward is this longer, longer commitment. So wrapping up with some next steps, um, the city is still finalizing our DEIS comments, and so we're interested in feedback today. We're continuing to, to get the emails from uh, from community members um, attending the CAGS, obviously, this month, um, and, and continuing our internal staff review of the document. We shared comments yesterday with city council, um, and then throughout uh, April have been sharing with community members, stakeholders, and other partners, and then we will transmit those comments to Sound Transit by the 28th. Uh, then we will pivot to a position on a preferred alternative. Um, we're expecting a joint council resolution on the alternatives in May or June. Um, and as I indicated in these, I think the staff recommendation right now is that there would not be a position taken um, for Chinatown International District um, on a single preferred alternative. Um, but then ultimately Mayor Harrell and Council President Juarez would engage with the Sound Transit Board discussions and action in June. closes us out with our high level overview of the city's comments. Thank you, Sarah. I just want to uh, make an announcement um, that I didn't make at the beginning because I thinking of other things, but reminded that we had promised to record um, this session um, and we are recording and um, I did note it in the chat, but I just know that some of you may not be looking at the chat. So if you don't want to be recorded, please uh, turn off your camera. Um, but we're recording it specifically so that if community members can't be here, or they're at work and they want to see this, um, they can see it. See it. So um, we did start a couple slides in, but I think we've got you know the meat of the presentation. So I apologize that I didn't make that announcement before. And thanks to our other city staff for. Uh, pinging me on that. Um, next, we're going to go to Chris Arkles at King County Metro, who will be talking about King County's uh, draft environmental impact statement um, remarks, comments. Go ahead, Chris. Um, great. Uh, Sarah, did you have my PowerPoint or? Uh... Oh, I can. Um, I haven't brought it up yet, but I can. Um... Okay. There was a question in the chat. Did you want to answer that while you're bringing it up? Um, oh, yeah, we can. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. We can, we can take a few questions now and then we'll take more questions um, for King County and then at the end. Um, question is, why isn't the RET enforceable over the DEIS? Why is it separate? So the I can give... Um, I think I can give a pretty good answer to that, but uh, our, our NEPA experts not with us um, right now, but the uh, the EIS uh, and all of the components and the legal really the legal parameters of what an environmental impact statement is are defined by our state environmental policy act and the national environmental policy act and that that's what lays out what an eis has to do what the elements are what the threshold is for um, whether or not the document is adequate. 
Whereas the RET is really a local tool that the city has created as part of our uh, race and social justice initiative that the city finds a, an incredibly important tool and that we that we choose to advance um, in tandem with EISs uh, at the city level and, and that Sound Transit has committed to um, partnering with us on in this multi-year project uh, for for Wisbley. So it's just, uh, you know, it's it's. Yeah, I hope I hope that answers the question. I mean, we're 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 trying to still carry the rep forward as much as we can in our DEIS comments as they are values that the city is upholding, um, but they're just not part of that state and national framework. So I apologize. I I, I am here, so I can just um, add to that. But I think you actually, Kokla, before you start, will you just introduce yourself really quick, please? Oh, of course. Sorry, yeah. my name's Kokla Lochin. I'm with Via um, Perkins Eastman, and I'm a consultant to the city. I've been working um, with many folks um, on this call as well um, on the West Seattle Ballad Light Rail Extension and a lot of the components that come with that, including the DEIS. Um, and I'm also not the expert. We have experts um, within our, our group, but, I'm, but I think, Sarah, you actually answered the question I was about to, to jump in. But, but one of the other things is um, the project is a sound transit project and it's FTA funded. And so FTA also governs, you know, the EIS process. And so I think Sarah answered the question, which is the city has the red, but that's why it's not um, enforceable mail-in per your question. Um, but, you know, the city has worked really hard to make sure that um, it is part of the process and that Sound Transit has developed um, a red for the project. Thank you, Kokola. Um, the, there's a series of questions, so I'm gonna read them from the chat and then I'm gonna go to hands. Um, you said that Wisbley is the largest transportation project in history of Seattle. Can you clarify why its size is important in this process? Critics said it won't reduce traffic by the time it is finished. Yeah, I can I can answer that and I can offer Marshall as well. But you know, I think we we tend to when we talk about Wisbley in, in the city to talk about the scale of the project. It's the largest infrastructure project of the city's history, just to really convey that this project is going to be hugely impactful. And that's why it is important, even though the project is 15 years out, you know, more than 15 years out, it's really important that we're paying attention now. And so we tend to use that talking point when we're talking with um, community members who you know, or even our elected leaders who think this project, you know, we don't need to worry about this quite yet. We're just we're just trying to really impart that, that this early juncture right now in the DEIS and making sure we get these impacts and mitigation uh, accurately captured is really important, even though the project is really far away. Thank you, Sarah. And then uh, the, the last question in this particular mm -hmm. string um, is your presentation has very little material about systemic racism in BIPOC communities. Can you comment? Yeah, you know, I would um, thank you for raising that. I would, I, I think I would put back that, um, you know, the city is approaching the DEIS review from our, our lens of regulator and what are these technical questions we're supposed to answer. But when we talk about what we really care about in this in this review, that's those final two questions. And the very first one was, what are the impacts to BIPOC communities, and what are we are we accurately um, capturing the impacts and mitigating that. And with that is yes, absolutely systemic racism. And I think particularly as we look at how this project has fallen in terms of the timing of it and the engagement and the DEIS review happening while we are through this pandemic and the racialized violence that we've seen during the pandemic and the reckoning of of our entire city and our entire society with racialized violence and systemic racism. I think that that is why you see the city asking that question. Um, is trying to make sure that we are furthering racial equity through this project to the greatest extent possible. So um, I'm, I'm sorry if that didn't come across and and I hope in our comments it'll be more more clearly uh, reflected. Thank you, Sarah. I will add that um, we have extensive comments on the environmental justice section and centered racial equity in our comments for the community engagement section. Um, and so, uh, so it's definitely um, a big piece of the draft comments. Um, and then I see there's, let me see who's in the, on a second, before we switch over to King County, we're almost there. 
Okay, uh, Denise Moriguchi, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Sarah, for sharing. And Nicole, um, Nicole had started the, the meeting by acknowledging the Jackson Hub planning process statement, uh, which had acknowledged historic harm to the CID and Pioneer Square neighborhoods and also highlighted the city and Sound Transit's commitment to racial equity um, and community values. Um, and then the, the statement also reminded us of all the thoughtful work that has been um, put into developing the Jackson Hub vision and concept plan. And I wasn't part of that work, but in reviewing it, it just seems um, to really enhance the neighborhood and build on, um, to create, create new uh, vitality where there isn't any versus kind of tearing down existing vitality. So I was curious if the city still supports the Jackson Hub vision and concept plan and how um, it's being considered when it evaluates the alternatives. Thanks. Yeah, I think, you know, when we are evaluating the alternatives for the DEIS, we are really trying to, what the city tries to do in the DEIS review is consider that any of these alternatives could be built. And so how do we for, how do we make sure that for any of the alternatives, the impacts are, are adequately analyzed and mitigated? And so in the context of the DEIS review, we're not advocating for one alternative over another. We're not um, carrying forward a specific vision. We're really trying to make sure we've done our due diligence that if any of these get built, we've made appropriate comments. I think the question really relates to what are the next steps then for a position on a preferred alternative and how does the Jackson Hub work feed into a vision of what could be there? And I think that's where it's really causing the city to step back. And, and I think all of the, the work from Jackson Hub is causing the city to step back and say, we can't make a decision right now based on the information that we have because we've done a whole lot of great work in Jackson Hub um, that has, you know, particularly looked around, you know, as as you note, not just tearing down the, you know, the existing community, but really building on the vitality that is already there. And so, how does that, how does that feed into, or how does a mitigation plan and a community benefits plan feed into that vision? How can it help support that vision? And that's where the DEIS doesn't give us the tools to do that yet. But sitting down and having that mitigation discussion with Sound Transit and with other uh, partners and figuring out what are what are the appropriate what is the appropriate community development strategy for this area and how does the project and mitigation help fund that and how do other sources of funding and other tools help support that as well and that's what we're hoping in that um, you know particularly in that longer term piece that third piece of building on the work that Jackson Hub has started to really figure out how does the project and Jackson Hub work together. But I will look to, you know, N Nicole or Rico or others on the phone that have been more closely involved in the Jackson Hub work to to represent it since I I'm, want to make sure I got that right. Thank you. I think that was accurate, Sarah. Um, I see that uh, Tiernan has a question. Tiernan, is that a follow follow on question or is that something we can hold till after uh, Chris is finished with his presentation. We can hold it. Okay, thanks. All right, Chris, where's yours? Oh, we can't hear you. There we can. Sorry, something was going on with my mic button. That's my story and I'm gonna to stick to it. Um, uh, glad to be here today. Uh, and I, I wanna talk a little bit first about Metro's role versus the city's role in terms of this. We are a participating agency um, and which means we've been closely aligned through this process. However, Metro's comments and uh, participation are strictly related to uh, the provision of transit service and the integration of a uh, bus uh, bus rail integration we don't uh, we're not going to comment on uh, anything outside of that area so we're mostly focused on coordination of transit service uh, in the area and i would say we are um, pretty closely aligned with the city in in uh, our thinking about the deis and the level of detail that was provided and uh, the need for more co uh, coordination metro will not be taking a position on any alignment choice 
Um, uh, my purpose today is just to outline some of the, the choices between the two areas. Um, both of the uh, alignments on fifth and uh, fourth uh, affect Metro to varying degrees, so that's what I hope to highlight. And um, we're, we want to work with the community and the city and Sound Transit to, uh, to ensure the best outcome uh, for the community. So um, go ahead, Sarah, and advance that slide. Um, so uh, yeah, impacts are going to begin as soon as 2025 with the Soto Busway closure. One of the things that Metro has to keep in mind is, is uh, the uh, effects on the, uh, the busway, which will uh, uh, require um, uh, a alternate path for our buses to get up to uh, uh, up to the city. We have about 1,200 buses who, that come up Fourth Avenue these uh, every day, and we have about 900 buses that come down uh, uh, Jackson every day. And uh, um, all of the trolley buses in the entire uh, metro system all come up Fifth Avenue uh, to enter the city street grid. Um, so, um, uh, so you know, some of uh, the major effects uh, uh, for Metro include uh, uh, closure of the busway that will require us to shift buses over to Fourth. Uh, there's effects on our bases uh, and uh, how we deadhead pathways. Deadhead is how you get the buses back to the base after they've been in revenue service, and a lot of a uh, varying degree of uh, impacts um, in uh, the CID and Pioneer Square. Go ahead and forward me to the next slide. This is a, just a useful fly, slide to show how long the estimated construction durations are um, and what we're going to have to manage for. Um, uh, uh, there will be, you know, added costs, added diversion for uh, for many bus routes. Um, and, uh, and, and in most cases, people will come up to in near uh, near near uh, downtown and have some uh, significant delays. Uh, um, so you can see the the construction durations um, there. Next slide. So, um, uh, you know, some of the uh, different uh, um, uh, impacts and mitigation mitigation um, uh, in uh, um, the this uh, uh, I probably should have left this slide out, but it just does, does show that we have a lot of effects in Soto um, and uh, losing the busway. We're, we're going to need some transit priority on fourth to keep our buses moving. Um, and uh, there's um, and uh, uh, that could be bat lanes. It could be uh, queue jumps, which Sound Transit has suggested. Uh, but um, it will be important to keep our buses moving with the loss of the busway. Uh, next slide, please. So um, uh, like the city, we don't really have a clear idea of the sequencing of all these street closures and uh, um, and effects on those. Um, uh, overall, um, I, you know, the 4th Avenue station alternatives are far more impactful to Metro and the overall transportation network. Um, uh, we don't have a clear idea of what the detailed mitigation is, uh, um, you know, um, but, you know, we want to work to uh, manage whatever is ultimately chosen. The 4th Avenue, we do believe the deep uh, alignments should come off. The 4th Avenue deep uh, displaces in the entire Ryerson base. It would uh, um, uh, pretty much cripple our network. So, um, uh, the loss of that base, we would not be able to provide the level of service to the rest of the county because all those bases are kind of interrelated. Um, um, and uh, so um, next slide, please. Um, uh, Ryerson base uh, is, uh, um, uh, you know, a, we we would lose the uh, um, uh, the the in, uh, the we currently access that base off the Soto Busway. We're going to have to manage through uh, a, a new access that ST would have to provide us off of Fourth of Massachusetts. We would lose a lot of the footprint of the base, um, and uh, um, it would also affect our efforts to try and electrify electrify our uh, fleet by 2035. Um, uh, so, um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, 
these this is just a, a useful slide to show all the major intersection and roadway closures that, that we have you know closures at fourth avenue and jackson uh, all, obviously a partial closure on uh, fourth avenue south we do have service that goes both ways on fourth avenue south um, uh, um, seattle boulevard second avenue extension uh, closure on south jackson that's particularly uh uh, impactful and enclosure of South Main, where we uh, um, lay over a lot of our bases. We would uh, have to, to have long term reroutes in a uh, um, uh, potentially a new electric trans, uh, trolley bus pathway and infrastructure. Um, uh, dead, you know, we would have a lot of effects on our service. Um, and uh, and uh, so we, um, uh, one of the things we're really pushing for is a more a uh, coordinated idea of how those closures are all sequenced so we can all manage through that. Uh, next slide, please. This is kind of a useful map that shows some of the key ro roadway closures that we're going to have to manage through throughout the uh, downtown area. And uh, you can see that there's a cluster of those uh, associated uh, around uh, the CID and Pioneer Square. Um, and uh, so Kind of reinforces the idea that we're going to have to be really careful about how we manage uh, uh, keeping transit service and uh, other service uh, going through the um, through the area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, we uh, um, also uh, would have uh, um, uh, some effects if a if a Fifth Avenue. Uh, 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 a pathway is chosen. Uh, obviously, if uh, uh, fifth, uh, the one that's in the street uh, uh, was chosen, we would need a new uh, trolley um, uh, pathway for all those trolley buses that come uh, through the system. Um, that would likely have to be uh, rerouted somewhere through um, uh, the uh, um, CID uh, um, more up on um, you know, seventh or eighth somewhere to try and get away from the heart of the CID. And we have explored with Sound Transit what some of those possible pathways would be. Um, the Fifth Avenue diagonal uh, would not close Fifth Avenue, and uh, we would not need to have those ele new electro uh, um, uh, trolley bus pathways. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, uh, we would have some effects to our bases as well um, from the Fifth Avenue um, uh, alignments. And next slide. Um, I'm not sure why I left this one. It seems pretty close to the other uh, other one. Um, uh, and uh, um, so this kind of sums up some of our service challenges. Um, we, um, Obviously, uh, uh, our, most of our service from fourth is coming from uh, uh, either uh, South Seattle or uh, um, Southeast King County. Um, and uh, so we would have a disruption for uh, several years um, and a lot of congestion effects. Uh, service to, on Jackson, um, we're not sure how we would manage around the closure of the fourth, uh, fourth and Jackson intersection. We may be able to use the uh, Contraflow lane that goes uh, up Fifth Avenue um, for a few blocks. Um, and we uh, um, uh, all the rapid ride light li lines would likely be affected. Uh, we don't have any formal place to lay over um, buses and uh, um, and uh, uh, to re re reroute pathways. Um, we have to work with the city to make sure that any uh, street that we are operating on is a uh, is uh, uh, transit ready. Uh, the street bed is is uh, 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 well constructed enough that we're not going to damage the streets. Now, one of the major, um, you know, one of the other pathways into downtown is First Avenue, and we've um, had ongoing challenges with the areaways on First and the and the uh, the quality of that street. And uh, sending that many buses would be problematic for the city and the neighborhood. Um, and uh, um, so uh, I think next slide that might be pretty close to the end. Um, so uh, we are very much in alignment with the city that we need to uh, have Im immediate uh, negotiations between 
ST Metro and S dot. Um, uh, it, you know, in part because uh, with the construction beginning as uh, quickly as a uh, um, uh, as uh, 2025, if we don't start planning now, um, uh, we can't. Uh, we're not going to be able to deliver these mitigations and these things. You know, um, there. You know. Uh, it's going to take coordination with between those departments. It's going to take some engineering solutions. Uh, those things don't happen overnight. Uh, it's going to take uh, mitigation and we need to figure out uh, all these things. We are currently in our budget process. We have a biennial budget process at the, um, and the, at the county and we're putting a lot of placeholders in there because we don't know what the effects on our operating and capital costs are. So. Um, we really want uh, some very, um, uh, you know, immediate discussions to uh, to start. And we also agree with the city uh, that uh, because of the high number of alternatives, uh, the, the DEIS doesn't provide a lot of uh, um, impact on design or uh, cost or mitigation. So, um, and uh, uh, next slide. If I have one. Sorry, I was on mute. That's your that's your last slide, Chris. Yay. Um, so um, so I am happy to take questions. Uh, we really want to manage through this uh, process. It's in, uh, um, we uh, we know that uh, that uh, that th this is very impactful on the neighborhood and we want to pl start planning immediately uh, for the future. So um, uh, happy to take questions. And um, I'm going to manage. I'm going to facilitate that, Chris. And um, I just want to note that Tiernan, I see your question, and I'm going to take questions specific to King County and then circle around because I think that that's a great discussion question um, for just a little later. So I'm going to hold it, um, and I'm going to start with. Uh, uh, this question from uh, Northwest Asian Weekly, Metro's conclusions about the impacts on Fifth Avenue vary widely from the analysis done by the consultants hired by historic, wait, H, HDS, do you mean, H, anyway, they okay. said the DEIS was I, I quite, believe he, I believe you mean HSD. Yeah, <laughs> I think so too. Um, that would be historic South Downtown. They said the DEIS was quite vague about construction sites. How can Metro be so sure? Uh, well, you know, I'm just trying to be as factual as possible. We there are effects on our trolley network if we're in the street, um, because it, that entire trolley network goes up uh, fifth, um, uh, and uh, um, um, and uh, you know there are Im impacts on our you know, uh, on our service network. Um, uh, so um, I'm not sure what specifically. Um, uh, you're uh, talking about that we, we disagree with it, the HSD analysis. I know that that analysis does some great work um, and uh, I've been, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I haven't poured over it in great detail, but I have, you know, met with uh, some of the people doing the consulting, so. And, and this is a question from some of the people doing the consulting <laughs> from Angie. Um, your presentation is largely focused on alternatives in CID segment. So you started with Soto segment also. Are there other alignment areas that are challenging for Metro or are those segments the biggest challenges for the agency? What about the rest of downtown, midtown and Seattle Center? Absolutely, we have uh, challenges through, uh, throughout the system. You know, um, uh, I would, uh, I uh, don't think we have that many uh, strong challenges in Midtown. Um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of issues around uh, Westlake. Um, uh, uh, you know uh, the alternatives there um, and the ones that they connect to. Um, Sound Transit has a complicated web of uh, of if you pick this station, you can only go to this next station. You know and so on. Uh, I would say one of our biggest concerns is. Uh, in uh, South Lake Union, the choice between a um, uh, a station at Sixth and Mercer and a station at uh, Fifth and Harrison, we do not uh, 
uh, support a sixth and Mercer uh, location at all because it's almost impossible to deliver bus rail integration there because of its uh, location next to the tunnel portal portal and we also believe it has a very poor walk shed so that's a a uh, station that if built, we would have a hard time integrating with several key uh, bus lines, including the E-Line, which is one of the busiest BRT lines in the uh, in the country with about 20,000 riders in, in, in normal times uh, a day. Um, and uh, uh, so those are our main concerns in, in downtown. We also have a, a lot of concerns in uh, West Seattle in the Delridge and Junction neighborhoods in terms of, uh, of transit integration. Um, in Ballard, I don't think we have as many concerns um, and, you know, so that's kind of our main areas, but we will be commenting on the entire line, so. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Denise Moraguchi, is your hand up or is that a legacy hand? Sorry, legacy. Okay. Um, and then uh, I see that Betty Lau, you had um, a comment in the chat. Do you want to say it aloud? you want me to read it? Well, I've been reading the DEIS sections on the Chinatown International District, and I, I have to uh, concur with the city. It is incredibly vague, uh, especially the sections on uh, social costs to uh, Chinatown, Japantown, Little Saigon. Uh, it's as though the writers had no clue uh, that there are people there that uh, this project is going to impact and uh, just uh, they just skip over the uh, impacts to uh, or don't fully understand the scope and scale uh, of the area as a regional hub. Uh, for people to come to. Uh, that's my comment on that. Then the other one is, I am wondering, uh, is Sound Transit, uh, how much obligation do they have to follow the uh, racial equity toolkit? Or is that optional for them? I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, Marshall, yeah, the, the, the racial equity toolkit um, is something that this that the city and Sound Transit are electing to do. It's not something that is required by law the way the EIS is. Um, mm -hmm. It's something that we are, you know, that the city does now almost with every environmental review process. And it, it is a matter, you know, I, um, I'm not sure that it's a matter of policy, but it's certainly a matter of practice that that is that that is what the city does and that we made, um, you know, very clear in Sound Transit, very willingly partnered with us to, to do this multi-year process of a racial equity toolkit and to make sure that we're bringing that information just as the DEIS information is being brought to the board, that the racial equity toolkit information will be brought to the board as well to inform those decisions. Um, but it doesn't, it does not, you know, just to be very transparent, it does not have the same teeth, if you will, that the environmental review does. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Betty. Thank you, Sarah and Marshall. Tiernan, I don't want to keep you waiting anymore. Thank you for being so patient. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my question is about the next steps, and I'm wondering, you know, is it the Sound Transit Board that will decide whether to do what the city is suggesting? Um, that's the first question, and and the second is, if that is the case, you know, what is the city's strategy for convincing other board members that that's in the best interest of the whole project? Can jump so in would on you like that to one. answer that? Yeah. yeah, Sarah, you've been doing a great job, by the way. Thank you. Um, so this particular question, yes, it is definitely the board. Sound Transit Board makes that decision, but your question spot on. Um, you know, we're caught, we're working with, um, you know, obviously our board members, the city of Seattle are aware of what we're sharing with you today. Uh, we're working with our other kind of King County board members and then frankly starting that, those conversations with the broader the other board members so they understand where we're coming from and why we're suggesting that. One thing I do want to be very clear about, though, um, you brought up the, the potential for delay in the timeline. 
we're not proposing that this would delay the advancement of the environmental work and the advancement of the next phase, which is to start the analysis in the final EIS. What, what Sarah described is a focused effort, and we actually think it, it should have a time on it, like six to nine months, to really refine those remaining options for Chinatown ID while the work on the final EIS begins to advance. We do think it's really important to try to maintain that schedule, but but we've seen this with other projects. You know, you can do a deep dive into these particular station alternatives while that's advancing. And hopefully having some clarity around, you know, the rest of the system, the rest of the Wisbley proposal in terms of station alternatives will help to kind of clear clear the table to really focus on, you know, more analysis, more mitigation. How can we refine those alternatives as the work advances? Does that help? OK, I, I would just add there is definitely a dynamic on the board uh, in Pearson, Snohomish County. Uh, they're kind of getting in our business a little bit to an unprecedented degree. Typically, there's some deference for uh, geographic areas and their preferred alignments. But they are very concerned in Snohomish and Pierce about the overall financial capacity of Sound Transit. And so they are pushing us hard to to limit our uh, uh, limit our choices and and pick a, a less expensive choices and demand some kind of third party funding from the city if we uh, if we choose certain things. So um, so there is definitely a dynamic that we're going to have to work through. And I think uh, our uh, city and in uh, King County uh, board members are 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 willing to uh, to make that argument. So, but um, but it is we do have a challenge ahead of us in terms of uh, the board dynamics. Thank you, Marshall and Chris, and thank you, Tiernan, for the question. Kathleen, let's go to you next, and then to Denise. Coming Kathleen out Johnson. Here. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for this. And um, I just want to echo a little bit of what Chris has said. I really appreciate the details as as you see them because, um, I mean, if HSD, we're working, trying to work with an equitable lens on everything that we do. And we certainly want to keep in mind that uh, both low-income people in the county have access to buses where they might not have access to other reliable forms of transportation. And we want to make sure that stays, especially for people who work and transfer through the CID. Um, so uh, thank you for that, Chris. But my questions and comments uh, regarding slide seven of Sarah's presentation, I am um, interested in pushing a little bit on any mitigation plan that uh, it really needs to look at the priorities of the neighborhood. And, um, you know, it. It has to deal with how do you mitigate permanent cultural impact? How do you mitigate the loss of traditional businesses? How do you mitigate the loss of local ownership? Um, how do you mitigate replacing these affordable, smaller scale street level businesses with, you know, new, modern, beautiful spaces, but that don't support mom and pop businesses to locate in them? Uh, you know, um, what is the quote that um, new businesses need old spaces because they're you know, they're made for sort of a, um, a, they're made for germinating these smaller business ideas. They're less of a footprint, lower cost, and small businesses can fight there and then potentially grow. And are we going to be losing that? Because that's a key part of the business culture. In uh, new ideas need old buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Jacobs. And, um, and we're going to, we're going to lose that and how do we mitigate to make sure that we keep that because that is part of the culture it's not just an economic impact it's part of the culture um and then on slide 14 and really throughout the rest of all of the questions that we're dealing with the ret uh has stated as an outcome desired for the cid in particular that in, it ensures the community shapes the decisions that impact them through self-determination and with a 100-year vision for future generations. If we really focus on minimizing the footprint on fifth, which we would have to do if it was on fifth, does that make a 100-year vision for future generations impossible? So that's an actual question. 
And then my other question is, I had heard something about the FDA uh, endorsing the RET or encouraging the use of the RET. And how does that, how, what is that? What does that mean? I see Sarah shaking, nodding her head. So I'll leave, uh, that's really two questions that I thought. Yeah, the, um, so the, the three questions I heard, one, the slide seven, absolutely not an exhaustive list, so thank you for the additional mm -hmm. context, and I think that the list of what we would want to see mitigated um, and identified in that process would be informed by community, so it's not, that wasn't exhaustive. Um, for slide 14, I think was the, um, the specific RET outcomes for uh, Chinatown International District in the RET, um, yes, I think you're absolutely spot on that we would want to have that conversation with community about you know and i think we have in that in that detail of step step two and if it's not on the slide it, it should have been of you know how does how do each of these alternatives that are advancing further the ret outcomes um as you know maybe that is not an, a technical eis nepa question but that is absolutely paramount for the city for sound transit and for others as we're trying to make the decision about where this station should go um and then finally, um, FTA does uh, does acknowledge that we're doing the RET. They have been very supportive. They are very aware of um, the the RET outcomes that have been identified in uh, the CID and in Delridge. Um, they've been supportive, but it's still, you know, I, I guess I still just want to be trans transparent that it, it that doesn't put it at the same level as the as the EIS NEPA process itself. Um, but, but FTA that. is certainly, um, you know, favorable of the additional engagement that the RET is uh, providing. As you can probably tell by our, the community's repeated questions about how the RET, it plays into the, the EIS. I think there's a lot of concern that this will be, a, this is an opportunity for promises kept. And I just want to put it on a positive footing. That this is a real opportunity to show that the way our, our elected officials and municipal uh, partners approach these large-scale public investments has changed. And um, I really hope that that is where we end up. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Denise Moraguchi, you have a question in the chat. Would you like to say it or would you like me to read it? Um, I can read it. And Kathleen definitely wanted to um, say I agree with everything she just said. Um, the question I have is about the um, if the city and Sound Transit have discussed the potential coordination regarding the reconstruction of Fourth Avenue Viaduct. I know that the Fourth Avenue option is very costly due to, um, particularly because of the reconstruction of the Fourth Avenue Viaduct. I know it's not a top priority right now, but it is something eventually that will have to be addressed. I guess I have a concern if. There's double impact down the road, um, so I'm just con uh, would like to learn more about you know what sort of conversations are having a um, regarding the Fourth Avenue Viaduct and what um, what coordination there might be. There are Marshall, would one of you like to answer that or? You can, can jump you? in if you want. <laughs> I'm like, can just, you? I mean. Denise, I think the biggest thing is that it's a great question. At this early phase, we know there's a significant additional cost associated with that, which you, I appreciate you kind of calling that out. Um, there's a lot of coordination, you know, as things advance and an alternative is selected, if it's Fourth Avenue shallow, then there's a whole process of preliminary engineering and design that, that Sound Transit will be going through. The city will be working closely as we have been. It is part of the Sound Transit project. Ultimately, I think it's important to be clear on that. We would, I think, you know, we're not there yet, but we would try to avoid a scenario where we had multiple agencies doing projects in the same space to try to avoid, you know, as you said, double impact. So we don't, there, there isn't a lot of detailed coordination on how it would be built at this point. It's mostly around, this is what the cost differential would be. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there's a follow up yeah. question in the chat that that I could take the city. Um, so the the second have extension structure and the the structures on Jackson are older and are uh, separate structures from the 4th Avenue South Bridge. Um, and they are in different condition than the 4th Avenue South Bridge. The 4th Avenue South Bridge was um, retrofitted 
about 10, 15 years ago, seismically retrofitted. So it's it's in a different class than the second Ave extension. So that construction for second Ave uh, construction, we don't believe would would trigger the need for reconstruction of the the fourth Ave South uh, viaduct. Um, another another nuance with the fourth Ave South viaduct is that. Um, the construction period that's identified by Sound Transit for Fourth Ave Shallow, which would would include the full um, rebuild of that viaduct structure, is an eight to eleven year uh, construction period. Just reconstructing the viaduct would only be a very small portion of that. So, just want to emphasize that um, I think there's a there's a concern that the city might come back and do the Fourth Avenue um, viaduct, and it would be another 10 years of construction. And just want to kind of emphasize that it's a it would be a far shorter impact. Um, but again, going back to this notion that we should be timing our timing our construction and our impacts to community in a coordinated manner, you know, absolutely that should be part of the the process. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Frank had a comment in the chat. Um, Frank, do you want to read that? Or I can read it. Yeah, you can read it, please. Okay. Uh, the Sound Transit Board dynamics should not affect Seattle's commitment to preserving and protecting the Chinatown International District neighborhood. All politics are local. It appears Metro favors fifth over fourth because of funding concerns. Chris, do you want to respond to that? I don't think we favor uh, fifth over fourth. Uh, we, um, uh, I think fourth has more impacts to our provision of transit and our, our bases. Um, so we're just trying to be factual about those impacts. Um, we are not going to take a position um, and uh, and you know we're going to manage through whatever is chosen. So um, when we won't we won't take any any position at any time. So um, we uh, you know we are not not favoring any position. Thank you, Chris. Kathleen, do you have your if, hand up? If I could just yeah, I do. I put it back up. If I could just uh, jump in. And Frank, I completely understand the concern is that. Cost is going to wash over everything else, right? So culture, promises made, whatever, cost is just going to wash over. And what HSD is interested in doing is really working with Sound Transit to sharpen their pencils and refine those costs and, and answer these questions about what can be done on force to get the cost down as low as possible. You know, they've done cost refinements along the rest of the alignment. So do that in the CID. And then really, what is the difference in what ST plan to spend here and what we're looking at? And then we'll work with the city and we, you know, push the city, push all of our elected officials at every level to say, well, let's get that funded because this is a 100 year investment. And if it costs extra to do it the way we think it's right, as opposed to really continue the harm in the neighborhood, then let's find that extra money. I, I was listening to NPR today and the federal government is going into small towns and begging them to take stimulus money. Well, you know, the CID is a kind of a small town. Let's answer them. Kathleen Marshall. I just wanted to to sort of add to that. I think part of why we're suggesting uh, this idea of, of of taking another phase of refinements is so that we can really tackle some of the factual practical issues that Chris was describing in terms of effects on city and regional transit. I mean, we all need to care about that issue too, especially as we're in our recovery. Tackle the cost. Delta, the cost delta, I think everyone sees the the, the significance of that. Um, that's something we think, you know, to make, you know, a smaller set of these alternatives much more viable gives us all the ability to make a better decision. Um, and if we can take a short period of time to do that, we're going to be in a better position to advocate effectively with the Sound Transit Board and others to, to do the best thing for the community. So I just want to add that. I think that's really what we're, why we're suggesting that. It's not you know, there's no hidden sort of favoring of one one over another. It's really trying to make um, them both more viable as choices. Thank you. Are there other questions? All right. Um, if there are not other questions, we can finish early. 
which is amazing. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to make a note because uh, all of you have spent quite a lot of time uh, with the city, with Sound Transit, and with um, with Metro, both today and in our earlier three um, workshops on this draft environmental impact statement and um, the different alternatives available. And so, um, so on behalf of of all the agencies, we all want to thank you. Um, and uh, and I also want to let you know that um, you know when I that when we receive comments, um, that those matter. And that those comments have actually shaped the um, the DEIS comments that we have put in, and they've shaped um, the the direction that, that things have taken. So I want you to know that um, it has not fallen on deaf ears that we are listening um, and we are responding as a city. So um, really appreciate all the work that you have all done. Um, in reviewing the DEIS as well, because it was really helpful um, in our comment building. Uh, Sarah or Marshall, do you want to add anything, or Rico or Greg? Thank you for saying that, Nicole. It, it really has. I just want to emphasize the appreciation for the amount of time and energy. Just in my short period getting to know this process, I'm so impressed at how committed you all are. And it's such a huge value for the neighborhood that you're as committed as you are. And we are doing our best to listen to that and respond. So thank you. Nico? I think that I, I think that anything I'm gonna say is entirely redundant here, but like I I also just really appreciate people's time because I know this is time that you're spending on top of the obligations that you have to your work and your families and yourselves. Um, and I know that it, it is in. Oh, you cut out Rico. So, OK, I I'd hope that you cut a little bit of that. Um, I just I really appreciate everybody's commitment to this process and the conversation and we want to do the right thing and we we can only do that with being able to hear your voices. Yeah. All right. Betty Lau, keep those emails coming. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank have you. A great, thank, you. thank you. Have thank a great you. rest of your Bye -bye. morning. Yeah. You can count thank on you, more emails. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.